Hello, and today we're going to be putting my 286 computer into a case. I have all the parts for it, even some extra parts I didn't have before, including a case, a hard drive, and some other things, and we're going to put it all together and see if we can get DOS installed on it and see if we can make it function. So, here we go. Okay, and we're back with our parts. We have our motherboard again, which is a Headland HT12 with a built on AMD 286 at 16 megahertz with a optional 287 which was already installed onto it. We have our video card, sound card, controller card, um, an extra little port for our controller card to add a serial and a game port. We have a hard drive, which is an NEC hard drive from 1996, and this is, if I remember correctly, one and a half gigabytes. Oh yeah, right there, it says 1623.1 megabytes. So yeah, it's about one and a half gigabytes, and last time I tested this drive, it worked, so I'm assuming this drive does work. This drive's a little, this drive's a little interesting. Instead of jumpers for setting the master slave or whatever, it's got this weird little, like, set of switches right here. This first one, it says on. You notice it says master tucked into it, so now this hard drive is set to the master. We have a floppy drive, 1.44 meg, and another floppy drive, 1.2 meg. These floppy drives hopefully work. I got them off eBay. They claim to have work, or the seller claimed to say they work, so it's fine. We have our IDE cable for our floppy drives an IDE cable for a hard drive, and I will be installing a CD-ROM drive, I will get to that later, and this is the audio cable for said CD-ROM drive, and our case is on the floor, so I need to move the camera for a sec to point at it, and here is our case, I found this on eBay, just listed as, you know, generic AT case, as you can see on the front, it has a megahertz display, it also has a turbo button on it, so this motherboard does have a turbo feature, and you can set in the BIOS whether it's by default high or low, and then the turbo button will change the display on the megahertz display, and also tell the motherboard to change to high or low. So, now let's get this case opened up, and get the motherboard installed inside of it. Ta-da! You can see the motherboard is now installed in the case. I uh, did that all off camera to avoid all of the frustration and stuff having to do with getting it in there. First off, it uses these little plastic things. Let me see that. There we go. One end, this end clips into the motherboard, and then the other end sort of slides in. You can see these little pieces there. It just sort of slides in, and that's how it holds it on. And. The motherboard is screwed in. One of the screws, for some reason, doesn't 100% line up with the standoff, so I can't get a screw in, but it's got two out of three screws. It's not going anywhere. It should be fine. Um, annoyingly, I had to take out this, the PCI slots, or ID, um, ISA slots. This whole part I had to come out in order to get the motherboard in, but then I couldn't get it back in because the battery was in the way, so I had to sort of, like, take the motherboard out on, like, an angle and then put it back in, and... Um, I had to take the hard drive cage out. Well, I didn't have to take the hard drive cage out, but it's much easier to get to some of the cables to plug all these in. The front panel connectors are connected. We have our reset button, our PC speaker, and our turbo switch. And finally, we have our hard drive activity LED, but that actually plugs into the controller card. And hopefully this thing will work, because I already cut my finger on it, and worked on all computers. If you cut your finger, that's a blood sacrifice, and that means it's going to work. So, let's get the first card installed, which is our controller card. Might as well put that in at the top ISA slot to hopefully easier manage the, the cables. Before I do that, let's connect the hard drive LED to the card right there. Oh, if I can get it on, not an angle. There we go. Right there. And then let's socket it into the first 16-bit ISO slot right here. 
Hopefully the motherboard is actually installed right so that these all line up. And yep, perfect. There we go. Now let's also put in our hard drive. Actually, yeah, let's put in the hard drive so I can connect all the cables as well as the CD-ROM drive, the two floppy drives, and then also the connector for the extra serial port and the um, game port. Alright, so let's get some drives installed. This is a CD-ROM drive. This is obviously way newer than this 286. This CD-ROM drive came out of my old Windows 95 machine, but I tested it. It works. I've seen a reason why it won't work in here. Um, I'm pretty sure the CD-ROM driver will run in DOS even on a 286, but I probably won't have it run all the time. I'll probably have like a boot menu so you can pick whether you want the CD-ROM drive enabled just because it probably takes up too much RAM otherwise. So that will go into this top slot here. It's close to being the same color beige, isn't it? That's kind of neat. Yeah, we get it all the way in there and put some screws into it. It's just one or two now to hold it in, in place. I can put the other screws in later. That is the wrong screw, I think. Crap, which are the right screws to use? This bag of screws, which you can't see right now, came with the case. And I don't know if it had the right screws to put drives in. If not, I'll have to go look in my collection of screws and find some. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. Hold on. Well, that was embarrassing, but I did mine, manage to find the correct screws, and now our CD-ROM drive is plugged in. I think I would have tested this ahead of time, you know, picking out the screws that are the right ones and making sure everything is good to go, but that's what happens when you don't like really script or, you know, plan anything. It's just, hey, let's film a video, and you don't really think about it ahead of time. But, anyway, now let's get our five and a quarter inch floppy drive installed. This came with screws in it when I got it, so I'm gonna assume those screws will work here, because otherwise I have to be, you know, find screws again. So let's get the screws that it came with when I got it, and hopefully those will fit. Yep, that's good. Let's just screw this on in there. Maybe, oh, not gonna fit. Interestingly, this floppy drive came with these these rails screwed onto it. I took them off, but these screws were connected to these rails onto the floppy drive. I don't know what these rails are for. Clearly, this came out of some case, and whoever sold it to me left the rails on it for some reason. So that's strange. So I'm just going to use the same screws I used to hold in the CD-ROM drive, because I know those will work here. I'm only going to put in the screws on this side for now, and then off camera I will make sure all the other screws, like on the other side of the case, are in, making sure the drives are secure and not going anywhere. So I apologize for constant shots of my head, but screws are over there. I need them over here. Alright, let's put another screw in. Makes me feel better to know that these drives are actually screwed in and not going anywhere. I don't know if that's catching. I think that this case is kind of bent. It got a little beat up, I think, in shipping. So, there we go. It wasn't completely lined up with the screw. I think it is. Now, you know, I don't like that. That is not good. The screw sort of somehow fit through this weird this slot here. I don't know how that happens, but um, I'm not going to get it back out again, so at least that drive isn't going anywhere. So that's good. Our 1.44 uh, meg puppy drive, 3.5 inch. Put that in this slot here. And screw it in. Maybe. Man, these old computer cases were just so much harder to deal with than than, than modern ones, you know? I mean, these are modern ones like NVMe drives. Screw them onto the board, one screw and you're done. 
here. You have to worry about which screw is the right one, which one is the wrong one. You have all sorts of weirdness with these cases and weird like drive trays and all other crap. So, and hey, most new computer cases probably don't make you cut your finger on them. So, it's also a plus. Let's get this floppy drive in there. Interestingly, this is the first floppy drive I've seen that actually has a logo on the front of it. It actually says Sony on it, like right, right there. It's, it's kind of strange, but I don't know, as long as it works. And now let's put the hard drive into one of the internal slots here. Let's just put it right here. Slide it in. And screw it in as well. So I'm going to be connecting both the hard drive and the CD-ROM drive to the controller card and just hope that, that that works. If I need to, I can also connect the CD-ROM drive to the sound card, but I don't know how well that will work, if it will work better or worse. I don't know if it even makes a difference. So for now, both all the drives are going to be through the controller card and the sound card can we can be used if I need it. Oh, that's weird. This drive, the hard drive is weighing down the drive tray. Ah, it's because I haven't screwed in the other side on the floppy drive. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna stop the video real quick, put all the screws in on all the drives, and then I'll be right back. All right, I got all our drives in and safely screwed in and secured, so now let's get our power cables all fired up which maybe should have been something I did beforehand, but, you know, whatever. All right. So, let's take this cable here and then plug it into the CD-ROM drive. Good. It's powered. Now we need power for both of our floppy drives. Let's see if this one cable here can reach reach both of them. Plug in the two and a half inch floppy power there. And hopefully the other end of this cable will reach right over to here into our other floppy drive. Good. That just leaves one more Molex for our hard drive. Simple. Alright. Now comes our IDE cables. Let's hope they're all they all reach. So now let's take our hard drive IDE cable here. Also our CD ROM drive IDE cable. And connect it to the controller card. There. Plugged in, and let's hope that reaches both of our devices, which don't think it will. I think I might need to move things around. All right, let's solve this problem. Well, let's get back to work. I've uh, connected the IDE cable from the controller card to the hard drive, and I've decided I'm just going to use the sound card because it does have a CD-ROM interface on it, so might as well connect the CD-ROM drive to that, because I put the CD here, and the hard drive here, and I don't have a cable long enough to reach between them, so let's try to use the CD-ROM drive through our sound card. Here is our CD-ROM audio cable, which I've already connected, and I'm going to assume that pin 1 here is the right channel, and I guess if it's backwards, it'd just be reverse stereo and I can always flip it. So let's plug this in here. And yeah, if it's if the channels are backwards, I'll just flip it around because it doesn't really matter. I've connected our ID cable to it already. So let's socket this hopefully in the next ISA slot. No, cable isn't reach. Shit. Crap. Let's see how I can make this fit because we need both of these to have ID cables on it. 
Maybe I can just jam it in next to it if I sort of fold the ID table. I think that will work. Mm. Uh, it's kind of sandwiched in there, and though I think the IDE cable is actually in there, maybe I need to see if I have a IDE cable with a smaller or more low pro profile connector on it. So let's hold on one more time. <sighs> all right, all right, all right, all right. So now we have our floppy cable. It's connected to our controller card, our hard drive connected to our controller card, our CD-ROM drive connected to our sound card, which is spaced away from the controller card by one slot to make sure the cables are nice and aren't pinching or folding against anything. So, so far, so good. So now let's get our floppy cable connected, which luckily is easy since they are right near each other. It's just that one has to go this way and then one has to be flipped around. Speaking of flipped around, pin 1 for the IDE on the sound card is at the bottom, and pin 1 for the IDE on the controller card is at the top. So that made things a little annoying. Alright, so with floppy drives, you generally want the red, the red stripe on the IDE cable generally points to where the power connector is. That makes it so you know exactly that it's connected in the right way. So let's... Man, is this cable really not going to reach? There we go. Man, there's not... Yeah, okay, there's this slack on this cable. Alright, let's get it in floppy drive. And then the other dro floppy drive uses the edge connector. So I need to flip the cable around. And make sure I plug into the edge connector with the red pointing towards the power cable. And there we go. Alright. That is all of our drives hooked up. Now the only thing we need left is our video card. Let's get our video card. Let's install our video card into one of the remaining 16-bit ISO slots. Let's plug it in right underneath the sound card. There's no cables coming out of it or anything, so it should be fine to put it there. Let's get the screw. Screw it in, and away we go. I think you're about ready to actually power this on. I'm going to plug in this as well to get another game port and serial port, because why not? I know we have a game port on our sound card, but our controller card has a slot for it, so see if we can get two joysticks working at the same time. And so... We have a power port on the end of our controller card, a 9-pin serial, there's a 25-pin serial, and I have an adapter for it, so let's get this put in. I'm going to put in slot covers on the other slots here, and then let's get this hooked up and see if it turns on. So before I power it up, just one more thing. We need a keyboard and I guess a mouse. So first is this mouse, which is new old stock. Um, found this on eBay, and it comes with a floppy disk with the driver, manual, and a mouse. Looks like it's never been used. It's a serial mouse. It's got three buttons. And I'm not going to use it like now, because obviously this DOS and whatnot doesn't need, doesn't need a mouse. Mouse, you know, mice were optional at this point. So, let's just put this aside, just wanted to show it off. But what isn't optional is a keyboard. This I found at Goodwill for a whole two dollars. This is an AT keyboard. Still completely sealed in, in plastic. I don't know how long someone's had this or how long Goodwill has had this, but might as well open it up and use it. This being a Windows 90, this being a Windows 95 keyboard, it has a Windows key on it. But obviously, a Windows key won't do anything in DOS. But as long as it's AT, it will work. Let's get it out of here. I want my box. There we go. Let's just slide it on out.
Ooh. Nice new normal keyboard. Oh, we have a AT to PS2 adapter. Don't know if I have any of these, so that's useful. And our keyboard. And some paper. Warranty. Some other things. Don't need that. how clean this is. Brand new keyboard. So clean. Not been touched by anyone. Micro innovations. Alright. Let's plug this keyboard in, power this up, and see what happens. Alright, and here we are. Computer is hooked up, keyboard is connected. I have not powered it on yet. Hit, hit, hit the power button and see what happens. I think it's on. The megahertz display says 333 three, three on it. There was a manual with it, and to set the megahertz display, you actually use, you like hold down the reset button, I think, for a certain amount of time to change the icons, uh, the numbers on it. It's a little strange, but I will worry about that later. Um, nothing seems to be happening. The power supply is on because, well, the megahertz display is on, power light is on, the turbo light is on, I press the turbo button, it switches to 666 and the turbo light comes off. 333, 666, turbo light on and off. Strange. Wonder if the turbo switch needs to be in a certain position for the motherboard to like it. Let's hit reset and see if that does anything. Something is not right. Our CD-ROM drive won't even eject. And I'm sure the CD-ROM drive works. Maybe I need to move the cards around, or they're not fully inserted into their slots. Though it looks like they are. Um. Well, time for some troubleshooting.